Just after Christmas, a Los Angeles TV station showed a cute segment showing children's reactions to bad presents. One set of parents had wrapped up an old shoe. So the segment showed their three or four year old opening it. Mom was saying, oh, look, it's a box. Isn't it fun? What's in it? It's one of daddy's shoes. Do you like it? And the little girl says, yep, and gets really excited. We talk to our kids all the time, but what we aren't always conscious of is just how influential our words and our tone can be. This is LD Expert Live. Did you know that telling your child to try harder can make it impossible for him to try his best? Telling a struggling or frustrated learner to try harder may cause him to overfocus on the details and pieces with the left side of the brain and shut off the big picture support of the right hemisphere. At Stowell Learning Centers, we work with a wonderful but easily misunderstood population of students. They are typically bright, often talented students who have difficulty with some aspect of school, reading, math, attention, study skills. Because they appear very typical, it's easy to mistake their academic challenges for poor motivation or poor effort Parents and teachers often inadvertently make the challenges worse with their own words of frustration. Welcome to LD Expert Live, your place for answers and solutions for learning differences, dyslexia, and attention challenges. I'm your host, Jill Stowell, founder of Stowell Learning Centers and author of At Wit's End, a Parent's Guide to Ending the Struggle, Tears, and Turmoil of Learning Disabilities. To get a free copy, go to parents at witsend.com. Hey, we have a really powerful show for you today. Our guest, Irene Lee, will be speaking with us about how the language of important adults in a child's life can impact that child's self esteem behavior, and learning. Let's get started by saying hello to Lauren Ma, our Director of Clinical Growth and Operations for Stowell Learning Centers, and to all of you, our viewers and subscribers who have joined us today. Good morning, Lauren. Good morning. Hi, everyone. Let us know that you're here and where you're checking in from. It's just so much fun to see where everyone is viewing from and getting to know some of you in the chat. Um, we have parents, we have a resource for you. Besides the show, we have our private Facebook group, Mom Squad. Uh, you can find it by going to our Facebook page or by searching Facebook groups, SLC Mom Squad. That is a private Facebook group of parents of kids and teens with learning and attention challenges. We share resources. Um, you can post questions. You can post questions anonymously by PMing me. If you just want to get any kind of like insight or, you know, just just rant or something, you know, and to relieve stress and just feel like you're not alone. So um, definitely check that out. SLC Mom Squad in Facebook groups. Last week, we broadcast our first peace meeting in Mom Squad and also through Zoom. And it was just so much fun meeting all of you. Uh, at our peace meeting, I had a lot of fun. We, uh, you know, I got to see some of you, some of you that have been with us on the show and been posting in the chat. Um, I got to meet with you at least virtually through Zoom. So that was a lot of fun. Uh, be on the lookout for an invite for next month's meeting. Um, we'll either, if you're on our email list, see it in an email or on our social pages, um, you'll get a link to register for next month's February meeting, our peace meeting. Um, and oh, we already have some people checking in. We have, looks like Diana Marie is with us from Pico Rivera, California. Uh, that's where my mom was born. I know that, that place. We have Savannah here from Utah and we have Annie here from Pasadena. Oh, a local to um, today's guest. 
And speaking of today's guest, I am really excited. So, you know, on LD Expert Live, we get to meet a lot of, you know, amazing experts, amazing professionals in their field. But I am really excited about today's guest because I know her personally. I've known her for almost nine years, Irene. She worked uh, closely with me at our Irvine Center when we both worked there for seven years before going on her own and being becoming the director of our Pasadena Center. And I'm just she has so much insight. Um, her, she's worked with hundreds of students and have watched them grow and graduated lots of students. Her parents have loved her and Pasadena is really lucky to have her as their director. So I'm really excited about having her on today's show and seeing what she has to share today. So keep posting questions. We have more people checking in. Looks like Malika from Maryland. Hello, welcome. We have Ronke from Ann Arbor, Michigan. Hello. And we have Karen from Sacramento. Hi, guys. Welcome. So really excited about today's show and really excited about hearing from Irene. Okay, I'll check back in in a little bit. So start posting questions or comments. Okay. All right. Thank you, Lauren. If you're just joining us, this is LD Expert Live. I'm your host, Jill Stowell. Today, I have the great pleasure of introducing you to our own Irene Lee. Irene helped us open our Stowell Learning Center in Pasadena, California. And as Lauren said, she is the director there. Irene has a master's degree in psychology with a focus in child and adolescent behavior. She has built an incredible team in Pasadena and is an expert in developing and facilitating relationships. Welcome, Irene. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited to be here. I think last week's show with Houston Craft and him talking about his book, Deep Kindness, are incredible. I think it was a great segue and super compatible to what I'm going to be talking about today, which is how our words have so much power. So I'm super excited to be here. Well, we're obviously, we're super excited to have you too, Irene. <laughs> We're talking today about how to talk to your kids to improve self-esteem, performance, and executive function. Mitch Albom, the author of The Five People You Meet in Heaven said, all parents damage their children. It cannot be helped. Youth, like pristine glass, absorbs the prints of its handlers. Wow. Thankfully, our kids also absorb some of the good things that we do. But no matter how good a parent you are, there are undoubtedly a few things that you would like to do over. Awareness of the impact of our words and tone can help tip the balance to the positive. Irene, I know you have so much to share here, so let's jump right in and talk about trauma and how it affects our kids. Yes, trauma is a great place to start. When we hear the word trauma, I think we mostly tend to think about huge, dangerous, and or explicit events, which it very much is, but it doesn't have to be. Most of us actually experience trauma through repetitive, consistent, and small moments. I recently heard someone describe trauma as too much, too fast, and too soon. So it could be simple messages told to us over and over again. For our kids, it could be constant messages like, you need to try harder. That's not for you. Why'd you do that? Or you're not right. It can be so much harder to interact with kids who have challenges. But we, I have to always remind myself, our kids are never truly doing anything negative on purpose. It's really because they truly can't or they're trying to cover up that they can't. Our kids are really trying. We either don't see it or we don't believe it. I always hear teachers and parents say things like, if he really applied himself, he could totally do it. Or, wow, this whole time I thought he was being lazy or not listening, but I'm realizing he could just not process me or he couldn't really hear me. And it's no one's fault to perceive these kids this way, I'll be honest, it certainly can look like a choice. <laughs> I think one of our missions at Stoll Learning Centers is to educate as many people as possible about how it's not a choice and where this comes from. 
But still, it will be after repetitive trauma or repetitive exposure to negative messages where one day a child will decide to kind of give up. You know, having difficulties with reading or some other aspect of school day after day, it is traumatic. But as parents and teachers, you know, as you said, we don't always see the correlation between the behaviors that we're seeing and the learning challenge. Irene, how do children and teens typically respond to ongoing trauma? So we usually see it in three main ways um, that kids typically internalize and externalize this trauma. All of them have a spectrum of severity. The first is what I kind of umbrella categorize as the behavioral child. So this might look like your class clown, your avoidant or evasive kid. They're being distracting by being really cute or helpful or charming or inquisitive or you're bad or too cool for school kind of kid. You know, there are kids definitely that, that kind of decide it's better to fail on purpose than to try and fail anyway. Most of the time, these behaviors aren't consciously intentional. They're coping strategies that are helping these students survive the challenges. You know, I remember a very social, charming, dyslexic student who would start making jokes and talking to his neighbors in class every time they had to do any kind of independent reading or writing. And he always had to take his schoolwork home because he barely even started it in class. At home, he had so much work with both his classwork and his homework, and he was so good at avoiding it that his mom just got in the habit of sitting with him and helping him get it done every day. Well, his mom and his teacher were really frustrated with him and they thought that he had ADHD, but he was just so adept at covering with his behavior, they didn't realize that he was struggling with reading and writing. So behaviors are one way that students cope with ongoing challenges and trauma. What are some other things that you see? Yeah, that's a great example. The second way that we see trauma being internalized and externalized is what I'd call an apathetic child. This is the child who feels no matter what I do, it doesn't matter, so why bother? So they easily give up or they don't care. They're always defensive, often give excuses for everything. It's the teacher's fault. Everyone failed the exam. Uh, they tend to be very cynical, Not, nothing will help them, or they don't believe your positive praises that you try to give them. And they very much have what is known as the fixed mindset, that your skills are fixed, unchangeable, so why bother trying? Hmm. And these attitudes can be so frustrating to parents and teachers. You know, when it, it I, I hear parents say, he, he just doesn't care. We know we've worked with thousands of kids who are struggling and they care, they do. But the attitude can mask the caring and the learning and the executive function challenges, making it look just like attitude. <laughs> exactly, yeah. And then there's a third way <laughs> that trauma can be manifested. Um, and I kind of umbrella term it as anxiety. So this can look like degrees of or full-blown anxiety or even more subtle ways like degrees of depression, low self-esteem, being very sensitive to little things or by being um, super perfectionistic. So I want to reiterate that we always have to keep in the back of our mind behaviors are a symptom of challenges. I mean, this is true for all of us, you know, like, why do I put off cleaning the house? <laughs> why do I procrastinate calling that person? Why do I re react so negatively when someone mentions a particular thing, you know? So for our kids, we have to be able to remind ourselves about the root cause because it will help us cool down. It will help us have empathy and choose our words and reactions much more carefully. I think of two examples of students that can kind of speak on this. So we had one student a long time ago named Aaron. His mom was very hopeful, but also very skeptical and understandably so. I mean, Aaron was a teenager. 
He was failing all of his classes and he certainly had an attitude that he didn't care. I'm sure this is super frustrating to mom. And, but we at the center saw great changes with Aaron and his, cl his clinician worked tirelessly every day to dismantle his cynicism and his internalized perceptions of how he wasn't good enough. And you could tell that this meant something to Aaron and he slowly but surely started to open up. But it's hard, especially for a teenager, to feel like there's hope, especially after struggling for so long. And unfortunately, his outside environments didn't cultivate the seeds that we were trying to sow. And then changes weren't big enough or fast enough for mom. So she concluded it wasn't going to happen and pulled him out too early, unfortunately. Whenever my staff and I think about Aaron or when we talk about him, we get so somber because we know that he that if he had stayed for the long haul to the end of his program, his life would be completely different. And that just breaks our heart. But on the flip side, we have another we had another student named Trevor. He was also a teenager. He also had low self-esteem and he was the type to constantly give excuses about everything. He knew this too, so he would catch himself and then further apologize about everything. So again, we have such a great staff who are so good about dismantling these ideas in our kids that you need to be perfect and that if you're weak in something, that's something to be ashamed of. Instead, we really work to cultivate a growth mindset and help the kids understand that when you constantly work on something, it can greatly improve and that's exactly why you're here with us. And we're going to be here for you every step of the way. So his mindset definitely started to shift and he became much more confident into diving into challenges, sticking with it, powering through. And because of this mindset, mind, uh, set shift, he ended up making dramatic changes by the end of his program, not only in his academics, but also in his work and his life ethics. And and his parents were right there with him validating that all along mm -hmm. the way, which, mm -hmm. which really helps cement that perception for the kids. Mm -hmm. Kids absorb so much more than we as adults tend to think that they do. So it's just really critical to be aware of how our negativity can impact them and how our positivity can too. But but that negative piece, you know, even if we're talking to our spouse, you know, and we think they're not listening, they hear, <laughs> they hear, they pick it up. So we just have to be aware. This is LD Expert Live. Today we're talking to Irene Lee, director of Stowell Learning Center in Pasadena, California, about how to talk to our kids and in particular, building an awareness of the impact of our words and of ne negativity. Let's check in with Lauren and our viewers, see what's happening there. Hi. All really good stuff. This is thank you so much, Irene, for bringing aware, awareness to this. This is this is really needed right now. We have a couple of other parents checking in from across the country. We have Michelle from south of Boston. Welcome. We have Sandra from Philadelphia checking in. We have Wanda from Aurora, Illinois checking in. And then Tammy is adding to the conversation. Behaviors are a symptom of challenges. Yes, Tammy, do you want to work for us? Preach to the choir. That's <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly what you said. And Irene, just kind of bouncing off that idea of of trauma um, reminds me. I mean, you know, parents can have some trauma too associated with their their child's learning challenges. We mm -hmm. recently tested um, a fourth grade girl, and she, I, I would say, both dad and daughter fell into the apathy ca category. So dad was the one that that arranged the the assessment and he was filling out all the paperwork and he kind of you know just even in the intake and you know the information that he was giving us about his daughter's challenges with school was saying like nobody thinks there's a problem teachers you know say that she's just not paying attention she's not trying she's you know she looks like she's given up i mean for a nine-year-old for a fourth grader to have already given up in school something's probably going on and and yet the school was kind of just telling him not a problem not a problem and I really do think that that can be 
traumatic to a parent to think mm -hmm. to have that gut instinct that something is wrong with your child and to want to help and for everybody to tell you no. So, mm -hmm. um, so dad, we did the assessment and we actually found what we come across kind of fairly often is that she actually um, tested really high in a lot of areas, similar to a, a student that would be gifted in that gifted population where everything is in the 99th percentile, greater than 99th percentile, except for auditory processing, which was in the low average 16th percentile uh, for most of the subtests. And so, you know, we had an inkling, hey, she probably has of, you know, above average intelligence, we don't do intelligence testing, but, you know, probably would be in that gifted range, except her auditory processing was holding her back. So that's causing that challenge. And in the in the consultation, you know, we're doing them via Zoom right now um, with parents, you know, so the evaluator described kind of how the consultation was going. And, you know, he's meeting with mom and dad, mom sitting here, and then dad's kind of off, let me see if I can do it. And dad's kind of during the consultation, not looking um, and he's, you know, maybe taking notes and this and the evaluator goes, I think, I think Lizzie might be gifted and dad, what? and dad, all of a sudden you could see him come back into the frame and just start listening and being engaged and start nodding and uh-huh, uh-huh. And all of a sudden it was like, it made sense to him. Um, and, and that just, that breaks my heart that there's parents out there that also have kind of been subjected to this cycle of being told nothing's wrong with your child um, and, and how traumatic that is when you know that something's going on. It was just amazing. So we got started with Lizzie. I mean, she only started, I wanna say at the end of November and already she's just making so much change. Um, her attitude with school has completely changed. Teachers are, see are seeing changes, parents are seeing changes. She's an amazing child to work with. Everybody at the center fights over working with her um, because she's just, she's just an amazing student and all that potential was in that child and parent could see it and yet they were told nothing was wrong. So uh, I just, when you talk about, yeah, trauma and that repetitive message of, you know, no, 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 yes. And that can extend also to our parents. So got to speak for the parents. Um, mm -hmm. I, we got more people from across the country saying hi. So Tammy from Dallas, Texas, hello. Um, Aslam from Azerbaijan, which is in country of, I can't think of it right now, but I will look that up for you. But it, I think I think you win. That is an international uh, viewer. Um, Susan from Chino. Yes. And um, Karen is checking in. What Lauren is describing is happening to a friend of mine. Tests are wonderful, except for one or two are poor in auditory processing and maybe auditory memory, I think, which leads to frustration for all. Yes, we see it time and time again, absolutely. Um, yeah, um, oh, it's a country, part of, uh, I'm, I'm looking it up now, part of, former part of the USSR near um, kind of the Soviet Union. Thank you and welcome for viewing. I think you win, Aslam, for being um, our farthest viewer um, internationally above Armenia, thank you. Um, we have Salt and Peppa checking in from um, Sayeda from Orange, California. Hello. Um, and Deborah Ann Afarian. Um, clarifying, thank you so much for my, my geography lesson today um, <laughs> about Armenia. Deborah Ann will be our guest next week on our show. Thank you for checking in. Um, I do have a question coming in from um, Mom Squad, a, a mom of a teenage girl. I think she's 13, it sounds like. Um, mom is saying, that her daughter drives her nuts. Um, she's on her phone 24 seven. Um, mom asks her to do something, whether it be something school related, um, check up on her assignments or chores. And, and her daughter says, okay, but she doesn't do it. Um, she, mom is feeling like, you know, she understands her daughter struggles in school, but it looks like she's not motivated. And it also looks like she's not grateful. And that, Kind of triggers mm -hmm. um you know all of us parents you know we're doing so much for our kids and when our kids seem like we don't appreciate it um that can definitely be frustrating and it's only gotten worse since um virtual school any advice for her you know part of what you're dealing with is normal adolescent behavior and you know just generational differences and and probably also then challenges with online school, which may be causing, 
you know, that, that avoidance behavior. You know, if I'm on my phone, then I don't have to deal with it. You as a parent, of course, need to set the parameters for what's acceptable and expected in your home. But I would really encourage you to include your daughter in the discussion. Do it at a neutral time. Agree to turn off cell phones while you're talking. So maybe take a walk to make that easier. And, and then just talk about what's really important to you and acknowledge what's important to her. You know, time scrolling through her phone is important to her. So we don't want to eliminate that. And then together, create a structure around school and chores and homework that meets both of your needs and, and le leaves some time for her to be on her phone as well. You're the guide in this, but make it a collaboration so that your daughter feels like she has some control and some buy-in. And uh, be sure and talk to her about other things than chores and responsibilities. Otherwise, she'll just tune, tune you out. If you're seeing avoidance of schoolwork since being in online schooling, really watch and listen carefully to understand what the real issue is. Many students are feeling overwhelmed or fatigued or like they're, they're not getting enough information in their online school. And so if your child was already struggling but getting by, the challenges now may, be, may just feel like too much to manage. So we want to just kind of watch and, and see what is really going on and then work together to solve it. Absolutely. Yes. And I know a lot of parents, um, it sounds like are experiencing the same thing with their teens. Um, and really it's looking like a lack of motivation. But hey, how, how have all of us been affected by this pandemic? I mean, you know, motivation is, you know, is one of the things that is affected when we are exposed to prolonged trauma or stress, um, which is what 2020 was. So totally makes sense. Um, we have NP checking in, cute little dog photo uh, from California, welcome. Um, so, so many people, this is resonating with you and all over the country, all over the world. Um, thank you so much for, post, for posting. Keep posting questions or comments um, and I'll check back in one more time before the end of the show. Thanks everyone. All right, thank you, Lauren and viewers. We'll check back in a bit. This is LD Expert Live. I'm your host, Jill Stowell, and we're talking with Irene Lee, the director of Stowell Learning Center in Pasadena, California, about how to talk to our kids and what to avoid. So we talked about the cumulative effect of trauma on kids and how trauma doesn't have to be some big dangerous event. How adults speak to kids can impact how they feel about themselves and the choices they make. Students with learning or attention challenges are particularly vulnerable because they struggle with things that they know they should be able to do. Yes, exactly, Jill. We never know what the breaking point will be for each individual, and we never want to think about the worst case scenario, but the reality is this can be much larger than school performance, and I think it's important to mention so according to the Learning Disability Association, 60% of adolescents in substance abuse treatment programs have a learning disability, 35% of kids with learning disabilities drop out of high school, 62% of kids with learning disabilities were unemployed a year after graduation, and 36% of kids in juvenile justice systems had learning disabilities. Amir Baraka, author, actor, and co-founder of the Dyslexia Awareness Foundation, struggled in school. He was labeled stupid and dumb and felt hopeless and lost. He says that he avoided spelling tests, hid in school hallways to avoid embarrassment, and eventually turned to street gangs for excitement and honestly support. He became incarcerated as a youth, and while still in prison by the age of 23, Baraka discovered he was reading at a third grade level when he was finally diagnosed with dyslexia while in prison. 
I think this diagnosis was kind of empowering for Baraka because, you know, he then went on to be this incredibly successful person. So again, we know that most learning disabilities are not indicative of low intelligence. Most of them have average to above average intelligence. There's just a huge discrepancy between their capacity to learn or their intelligence and their level of achievement. And that's so important to know. By definition, a person with a learning disability, including dyslexia, has average to above average intelligence. So the challenges their experience aren't lack of into intellectual capability. And they're not the result of laziness or poor motivation either. So Irene, let's talk about some solutions. Yes, my favorite part. <laughs> so I keep saying, Everyone, parents, teachers, students, educators, we're all trying our best and we always mean well. But let's be honest, we are largely conditioned to send some types of messages in this high performing culture. I've also had many kids who had such amazing supportive parents and teachers, but the child was still traumatized by messages of the world. So how can we take control? There's this amazing book that is widely known by now called Mindset by Carol S. Dweck. It's now a constant reference in my repertoire. <laughs> she talks about fixed mindset versus growth mindset, which I've mentioned a couple times. So to put it simply, fixed mindset is the idea that our traits or characteristics are given to us at birth and are unchangeable. Growth mindset is the idea that we can improve in what we consistently pursue and practice. So we all have a tendency towards one mindset or the other. For someone with a heavy fixed mindset, trauma can be particularly impactful. As adults, we think we're giving helpful judgments, lessons, motivating techniques, but oftentimes we're probably sending a message we don't intend to. For example, when you hear something like, you learn that so quickly, you're so smart, we think that's, that's a great affirmation. But that can be eventually interpreted as, if I don't learn something quickly, that must mean I'm not smart. Or an affirmation like, look at that drawing, he's the next Picasso. That can be internalized as, ooh, I shouldn't even try drawing anything hard so that they'll see that I can't compare. Or something like, you're so brilliant, you got an A without even studying. That can be internalized as, ooh, I better quit studying or they won't think I'm brilliant or you're better if you're able to get an A without studying. So praising intelligence harms motivation and performance, like, wow, you're so smart, or wow, you're so fast. This kind of praise begets only a momentary boost, but as soon as difficulty or challenges arise, confidence is lost. It will become internalized that if success equals smart, then that must mean failure must equal dumb. Instead, we wanna teach our kids to love challenges, be intrigued by mistakes, enjoy effort, and keep on learning versus loving intelligence. Praise them for growth-oriented processes, what they accomplish through practice, study, persistence, and good strategies. For example, some language you might use is, you really studied for that test and your improvement really shows it, or, I like the way you tried all kinds of strategies on that math problem until you finally got it. Or, I like that you took on that challenging project. It's going to take a lot of hard work and you're gonna learn such amazing things. If something's too easy, instead of saying something like, wow, you did that so quickly, or wow, you didn't make any mistakes, say something like, oh, that was too easy. I'm sorry that wasted your time. Let's find something that you can really learn from. A helpful way to remember what kinds of words to use is the more specific you are, the better. And it and then it gives students something that they can continue to work towards. You know, we, we want to ask for what we want more of, you know, as opposed to something that they really can't control. So that growth mindset, I love that, Irene. It's so powerful. And, and it's really just a slight shift in our thinking and language, but it can make a huge difference in how students view themselves and their performance. So 
should we avoid all negatives then? Yes, yeah, so you definitely don't want to avoid all negatives or failures, but provide honest and constructive feedback. Mm -hmm. So if children are protected from failures and negatives, then they will themselves experience it as negative and undermining. I find this often when training clinicians is that they become very hesitant or afraid to flat out tell a child that they're wrong or what they're doing is not con conducive in a nice way because they don't want to hurt the child's feelings or they won't address a behavior that's accommodating because it gets them by, but it's not ideal. Mm -hmm. As growth-minded teachers, we have to tell the students the truth and then give them the tools and teach them to use them and empower them to close that gap. For example, instead of tiptoeing around the child about them having dyslexia, tell the child that they have a unique dyslexic thinking style that allows them to be incredibly creative and see things in a way that I can't see, but this comes with a tendency to make reading uncomfortable and pages difficult to look at. The good news is that it can be fixed and that is what I'm here to help you with eventually do all by yourself. So let's practice, you know? So at the same time, judging and punishing also send the wrong message. This is not teaching kids how to think through issues and come to ethical mature decisions on their own. Also, constant and immediate punishments are probably not demonstrating open channels of communication either, which is, I'm sure, what we all want from our kids. So the next time you're in a position to discipline, you want to ask yourself, okay, what exactly is the message that I want to send here that I'll judge and punish you for doing something bad or wrong, or that I will help you think through it and learn from it? Wow, good stuff, Irene. Thank you. You know, there are some children who have very intense negative behaviors. What suggestions do you have for breaking that pattern of bad behavior? Yes, there's um, another great book called Transforming the Difficult Child by Howard Glass and Jennifer Easley. And I swear by it, <laughs> ever since I read it and I put it to practice years ago, it's been a huge and effective tool for myself. Um, their approach is called the nurtured heart approach and it can be quite an involved process, but I'd say the basic principles can be applied and effective for most challenging kids, although it does take commitment. So the basic idea is that people are kids' favorite toy. So toys and especially video games are incredibly animated, responsive, and rewarding depending on how you respond or how you interact with it. People are a hundred times more animated, responsive, and rewarding depending on how you interact with them. So, um, however, we tend to give the most energy to negative things like bad behavior or getting a bad grade. And then we tend to give energy to positive things much less frequently. And it usually has to be a crazy, amazingly extra positive thing in order for us to be as energized as when we're upset. This causes kids to learn to do more negative behaviors to get the biggest reactions, especially for kids who seem to never be able to get anything right. This is just an un unconscious pattern that they learn. So instead, flip it. Give no energy to and essentially ignore negative things and give tons of energy to not only positive things, but even everyday regular things like brushing their teeth, eating all of their food, sitting still at Zoom school for 10 whole minutes, or asking for help to tie their shoes, you know? So if a student starts being silly, here at the center, we'll say something like, I'll know you're ready when you're sitting in your learning position and you're looking at me. And then we completely ignore them or we ice them out <laughs> until they do exactly that then we'll be incredibly animated and say something like, wow, thank you for showing me your body is ready to learn. I'll give you two points for that or something like that. <laughs> yeah, you know, um, that's such an interesting concept that, that we're looking for something from each other. And some kids, they just need so much and, and, you know, it's true on a day-to-day -day basis when kids are doing what they're supposed to do, we're kind of like, you know, well, that's what they're supposed to do. <laughs> and then when they're not, you know, we get all hot and bothered. So so flipping that around, again, it's, it's you know, a little shift in mindset that can make a huge difference. 
And of course, we can't do it just once. We know from working with our students to help them re resolve their learning challenges that consistency, frequency, and intensity are really important. Yes, super great point. It takes hard work and commitment, but like you said, frequency, intensity, exposure, rep repetition are also so important in building habits, skills, and a different mindset. So with all of these tactics that I've mentioned today, stick to it, you know, be intentional. And I can, I can guarantee that with time, it will make a, a difference. At the center, we've noticed that the more frequent, frequently we see a child, the more chances we have to repeatedly expose our influence. <laughs> so I think of two examples. We had a teenage girl who had incredibly low self-esteem and a very perfectionistic mindset. And then during a summer three hour a day, five days a week intensive, we had so much time with her to influence that mindset and continually reinforce that we don't care if she makes a mistake and that no one should care. <laughs> that mistakes are the best way to help us learn and grow. All that we care about is her persistent trying. And by the end of her intensives, she was much more a confident and resilient girl. And then this kind of around the same time, we had another teenage boy he was in his last phase of his programming with us doing executive function, which can be quite challenging, especially with teenagers. And this was, I guess, kind of at the beginning of the pandemic. And his clinician saw him only 30 minutes a day on Zoom, but five days a week. And just that simple repetitiveness of accountability and a positive supportive cheerleader in his court allowed him to make dramatic improvements in his performance, attitude, and outlook on life. Um, I mentioned Houston Craft at the beginning of the show, um, and he was the guest last week in his book, Deep Kindness, our must, it's incredible. He mentions how we tend to have easy and default affirmations like good job or way to go. But he says this quote that I love. He said, our dexterity with language must catch up to the depth of our love. And I just thought that was so profound and super relevant to mm -hmm. our topic today. Wow. I. I love that, Irene, that that really does fit. This has been so helpful. Let's check back in with Lauren and our viewers one more time before we wrap up. Hi, this is, this is really relevant. Parents are responding. We have um, Taylor saying such great information. Um, we have MP saying she ordered the, the mindset book. We posted the link in the chat, so be sure to check that for both mindset and the nurtured heart approach um, books that Irene referenced so that you can check them out yourself. Um, we do have, um, so, so just some clarification on language. Beck is saying trauma seems like a strong word for a child's fixed mindset or avoidance of doing schoolwork that is not of interest to him or her. Um, and then Savannah kind of commented in that thread, great point. What Irene said was that trauma comes from the constant messages of you're not doing good enough. And like you said, Irene, it doesn't, trauma, I think we associate language, um, trauma is big and, and negative and yes, but it, but it doesn't have to be a big event. Trauma could be repetitive, negative messages. Trauma is anything, right, that gets us to change, that anything negative that gets us to change our behavior. Mm -hmm. um, or puts yeah. us puts us into that stress response. You know, a lot of times because our struggling students generally are quite bright. I mean, sometimes I think a lot of our students are actually probably the smartest kids in the class, but they're struggling and they know they're struggling. And so not only are there some external messages, but there are internal messages. You know, they're saying, oh my gosh, what if the teacher calls on me and I'm not able to read it and I look stupid? Or what if I say something and somebody already said it? You know, a child with an auditory processing issue, that happens all the time. They, they miss something and then they say something and the rest of the class laughs. And so now they've got all this internal dialogue going on. What if, what if, what if, you know, or 
I'll never get this, or I'm such a failure, or nobody likes me. And there's a lot of stuff going on because, you know, it, it just isn't quite in sync for them what they feel like they really should be able to do and what they actually are able to do. And that's traumatic. And, and believe me, we can feed ourselves messages like that all the time. Right. Absolutely. Um, kind of in that same vein, we have Savannah. This is kind of a long one, so we'll have to all go up. Okay. Um, Savannah, we moved to a new home this year and my first grader started a Chinese immersion program every other day at a new school. At the beginning of the school year, it usually took me an hour in the hallway to convince him to go sit in the classroom. So, I mean, that that is not typical, I would say. You know, some kids don't prefer school. You know, Meh, it's not your thing. You know, you got to convince them to kind of start their homework. Sitting with your child in an hour to try to convince him just to go into the classroom, that's not typical. Yesterday, his teacher ch changed where he sits because he doesn't focus and complete worksheets and worksheets aren't challenging for him. And today he refused to go into school again because he was too nervous to sit in the new spot. Um, her comment got cut off. I have, let me see, I can find the rest of it. Um, she said, I'm here to find out, um, I'm here listening to find out how to speak correctly to him to help him accept small changes at school. Any advice for Savannah? Irene, do you have something that popped into your mind that you want to want to say there? Um, no, you can go ahead. Um, you know, there is something going on. Um, if if it's that, I mean, that feels traumatic. If it's that traumatic for him to go to go in there, and so I think the first thing is, you know, you've got to you got to figure out what that is. I mean, that is not a discipline issue that's going on there. There is, there is something else. And so, you know, it might be that you guys just sort of sit and cuddle on the couch and, and dialogue about, you know, Hey, it's really, it's really tough for you to go into class in the morning. Tell me about that. And, and see what comes up. See if we can, you know, it, he's afraid of something. And maybe it's that he doesn't understand, that he can't do it. Um, and then the teacher changing his spot. I mean, the teacher probably felt it was going to be helpful. I'm going to move him to a place where he can pay attention better. But now that's one more thing that is different. And, and that means he has to be flexible with it. And already he's, you know, he's, he's rigid because there's something that's really tough there. So, so whenever there's a change coming up like that, you know, I like to role play with kids, to dialogue it, to, um, you know, look at exactly where the seat is. Maybe he's afraid if he's, you know, on site, he's afraid he's not going to be able to find the right chair, or maybe the people next to him aren't going to like him. So again, you know, you need to just spend some time just asking some open-ended questions. You know, I wonder who's going to sit next to you in your new spot. Tell me about that, you know, and, and just kind of dialogue and see then if you can get a handle on what is it really. And, and then, you know, I really like to practice with kids, you know, walk it through, practice it, talk about it, you know, as they role play, just to kind of get used to an idea. Absolutely. And to piggyback on that, last week when we had Houston Craft on, he talked about the importance of labeling and getting kids to use vocabulary to label their emotions. And I, I shared that I, I've been doing this with my five-year-old um, recently of just helping see if you can explore that with your son. It sounds like he is very bright. Obviously he's taking a Chinese immersion uh, class, mm -hmm. um, you know, explore with him. You know, what is that feeling that he gets in the classroom? Is it nervous? Is it, is he scared? Okay. Why are you scared? What part is scary? Um, and just exploring language, you know, nervous, um, anxious, um, you know, um, I'm afraid something might happen, things like that. And really 
trying to to give our kids the appropriate language to describe how they're feeling really does help for them to feel a little bit more in control and really identify what their little bodies are are going through. Um, mm -hmm. But this kind of came up. It, it, we talked about this in our peace meeting last week. That you know, I mean, kids you know, you know, kids have preferences. Sometimes they, they don't always like school. They might not like a particular teacher. They might not, you know, drive with them or something like that. But, but constant avoidance, um, crying, you know, tears, tantrums over school is not normal. And so when kids do that, they are avoiding something that is very uncomfortable and mm -hmm. there's usually something lower. And so to investigate that, um, is, the advice I would I would give what what is making besides the changes what else is making um, things so hard in that classroom? Mm -hmm. um, so absolutely, we have. Uh, let's see if I can. Let me let me thought. give one other suggestion for this mom, and that is that that you know we've been a little bit in a series here with with Houston's talking about kindness and language around that and and Irene talking today and next week we have uh, another guest who's really talking about some of these baffling uh, behaviors. And so uh, be sure and jo join us next week too because it's a little bit of a series and you'll get some more tips there too. Absolutely, and Savannah says, I will do these things with him. Thank you so much for your comments, heart. Um, we have, oh, Irene, does his name sound familiar? Jeff, oh. Fresco, happy and happy, hello and happy new year to the wonderful staff at Stoll. Big thank you to Irene and Taylor for all your care and hard work. Great oh. to see and hear from you. Ellie loves and misses you both. Oh, thanks, Jeff. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Kara is checking in. She's saying this is helpful. It is so helpful. Um, absolutely. We have, let's see. Um, Heather, this is kind of a, a complicated situation. How to help my grandson, who I have custody of, and we do hear from a lot of uh, grandparents, um, that was recently diagnosed with ADHD, uh, PTSD, so some trauma, definitely, and fetal alcohol syndrome. He was abused by stepdad after uh, her son died. So definitely, that would be the big event trauma, definitely. And, mm -hmm. and we do see kids like that. I mean, so any suggestions when there is big trauma um, involved in a child's life? That's pretty heavy. Um, I think it takes a lot of like a, like a village, you know, um, professional help. But at the home, I think it's, it's going to be like little moments of trust, like um, to just make, really make the child feel like they're trusted. Um, so, you know, whether it's like constantly telling the child um, different ways of saying, I'm here for you, uh, I see you, I hear you, um, you know, I'm, I'm here to protect you kind of thing. Um, and kind of um, similar to the response that Joel gave to the other um, child is really dialoguing of their feelings. Something we like to use a lot here at our center for little guys is an, an emotion chart because a lot times children can't label their emotions except sad, mad, you know. Um, so giving them just kind of a, a basic emotion chart with smiley faces or emojis that help convey that specific emotion and then them choosing and then be able to um, come up with a dialogue um, off of that um, is something that we, we do a lot here as well. Jill, do you have things to add? Oh, I was just thinking when you were talking about that trust and and safety, you know, um, touch is is communicates a lot, and so um, just you know wherever you can, just the the touch on the shoulder or the hand, or you know, just to say I'm here, you know, and um, I'm not going anywhere. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, Let's see. Uh, and Heather adds, I do have an emotion chart for him and he he is going to therapy. And that would be also, we said, definitely working with your team of professionals, um, you know, when when there is a lot of heavy, big trauma involved. Absolutely. Um, right. Alexandra Dennison chimes in. She was a, a past guest on our show. Um, building a, an emotional vocabulary is very important. Having the language for emotions helps to 
access them and identify them. If we can't identify your feelings, we can't manage them because we don't know what we're feeling exactly. Um, so let's see. No, I clicked on the wrong one. Hang on. <laughs> um, and uh, Deborah Ann is who will be our guest next week. Uh, we talked about uh, Valerie Lipow holds um, oh, a fetal alcohol support group. So a resource for you, Heather, um, that can be extremely helpful. And she posted the link in the comments. Um, and Heather is kind of adding, it's really hard to get him to do schoolwork or focus. Definitely, um, you know, mm -hmm. one, he's already struggling because of the learning and attention issues. Um, and then you layer trauma on top of that. And, and of course, this little guy is up against a lot. And so it does take definitely a team. It takes consistency. It takes support um, because things are going to be hard for him. And and that that is where he is right now. That's when we talk when we work with students, we always encourage parents and and when we train our, our staff to work with students, we say meet them where they are, you know, not where we think they should be that that is where her grandchild is starting where her grandson is this is you know all these things kind of happened to him that were outside of his control she needs she and the team need to meet him where he is school is hard it is hard to focus he is going to have avoidance behaviors that is normal I, you know if if any of us were to have gone through a lot um, that he's gone through and, and have learning or attention challenges we would probably avoid what is hard too and kids do kids and adults avoid what is hard so meet him where he is. That's your starting point. And, and always, you know, kind of in that growth mindset mentality, be working towards, you know, the next step or the, the you know, we're working towards a new goal, even if it's a small, small change, you know, let's try five minutes on Zoom. Okay. And then take a break. Um, you know, any kind of small shift that you can make, eventually they do add up. And that's when we, when we see growth with our students, you know, sometimes we forget because we're always in the here and now we forget how far they've come. We look back and we're like, oh my gosh, can you believe at where he or she started? Um, so make tiny little um, changes and little tiny goals would be my my advice to you, Heather. Um, so great, I, I love that we're chiming in and, and we have a lot of advice here in the chat. Um, I wanna get to Yvette has a question. My third and fourth grade ADHD sons loathe virtual learning. Um, he says he's so bored, the teachers are not engaging. What should she do? Yeah. I, <laughs> I the, first, the first thing I would do is really validate, like, yeah, it is boring. <laughs> you know, like I hear you, like your your feelings are totally valid. Um, you're not the only one, you know, Zoom and just virtual learning, that can definitely be a learning thing. And um, yeah, I think first step would be to validate. Did you? Um, and I was just thinking, you know, yeah, we definitely have to start where they are. And, and maybe, you know, you just challenge each child, you know, I don't know how many children there are in the family, but um, he, challenge him and, and any other kids in the family to to listen for one thing that that was kind of like oh i didn't know that or or that was interesting or that was different than they thought just one and and then share that at the end of the day um, sometimes just making one tiny little change one tiny little new habit can start you know, the domino effect of some other habits coming along. That's great advice. Um, we have another, <laughs> this is a, a question in mom squad and I hear this question a lot from parents. Um, delicately, how do I suggest to my son's teacher that she validate him when he is trying and mom's at home with him, watching him do school, he is trying but doesn't get that positive, uh, you know, affirmation from the teacher. How how do parents gently suggest to teachers that that um, they validate our kids? That's tough. Um, our our staff often communicates with teacher their students' teachers, and oftentimes when the 
the clinician just kind of explains that this child has underlying things that they're struggling with, that just kind of opens up the the doors and the teacher's minds are like, oh, I didn't know that. Um, and then just shifts how they perceive the students. So just kind of describing what is going on and, hey, we're doing everything we can. I have my eyes on him. Um, is there any way that, um, you know, you can not accommodate, but um, is there any support that you can offer or suggestions that you can make because he struggles with math in particular or tuning in on a Zoom class for over 30 minutes, you know, and kind of help them feel like a, like a, um, like a hero, you know, um, mm -hmm. someone who can partner with um, to help this child, you know? Yeah, those are, those are great suggestions. You know, um, I, this is a little bit different, but um, I think we also have to meet teachers just the way we do with kids, starting where they are, uh, validating, so if you want to approach the teacher, you know, validate, wow, <laughs> this is such a tough time, you know, I'm, you know, I so appreciate <laughs> everything that you as a teacher are doing for our kids. So just starting with some validation and, and, you know, then being able to say, don't say, but, because that sort of negates everything you said before it, but, but say, you know, online schooling, I know it's tough for you, it's tough for my child, and um, and it's really hard to see on Zoom, but I just wanted to let you know, he is trying really hard, and, and he values your opinion so much that, um, you know, if you could, if you could also uh, val you know, validate him for his effort, I think that would make a huge difference, you know, because I'm trying, but I think it would make a bigger difference coming from you, sort of like engaging the teacher's help, but validating where they are as well. Absolutely. Uh, Ron K is piggybacking, starting where the child is matters. My daughter's teacher told us, still using her fingers, counting on her fingers to add, and the teacher says, I can't wait for her. And so, you know, um, and I've heard this from a lot of parents, like, you know, it, it's defeating, you know, that that a teacher says that and gets frustrated with with a child. And and I know I, I was a former teacher. It's hard when you have 30 something little little guys and now 30 something little boxes in Zoom. Um, it, it is stressful. It's probably traumatic for teachers as well. So um, communicating and just, you know, being your child's advocate and and but also being a partner with the teacher that you understand mm -hmm. where they're coming from as well definitely uh ron k says uh thank you for all these helpful tips irene jill and lauren too and we have sue saying thank you to the wonderful counselors at stole pasadena they are a blessing so mm -hmm. i think you know you know who that is irene i do hi sue <laughs> yeah so so awesome thank you so much uh for sharing um Parents, if you want to keep the conversation going, you can ask to join our Mom Squad private Facebook group. Um, searching by, you can find it by searching Facebook groups SLC Mom Squad or find it on our Facebook page. This, I mean, I'm, I'm this conversation w has been amazing, and just hearing from you and kind of everything that you're dealing with with your kids, we definitely have a community of parents who get it there at in Mom Squad. So feel free to join, and you can be part of this conversation. Um, and our peace meeting, I wanna remind you about that. That's another place where you can feel heard and be connected and get some resources and support for you. Um, our next meeting is Thursday, February 18th at 5 p.m. Pacific time. And again, it would be, it's just so awesome to see you. I've, I've seen you in the comments, um, but to see you and participate, it is a Zoom meeting. So you do need to register to get the link to participate. Um, you know, live with us and, and be part of the conversation. You can also view it if you are in Mom Squad. We will broadcast it to Mom Squad and we pay attention to the chat there as well. So look for details about how to register for our upcoming meeting on February 18th. Um, we have still a lot of people. Um, <laughs> Janet, thank you for the wonderful webinar. Thank you. Aslam, thanks to all. Um, let's see. Let's see. Uh, Ron Kate kind of added, yeah, when her child when her child was in second grade, that's when this, she was getting negative comments. And Heather saying thank you all. So 
awesome information. Irene, you're you're a treasure and <laughs> Vita families are just so lucky to have you. You're such a gem. We're so lucky to have you here. We have a big stool family and I am honored to know you and to have worked alongside you. Um, and so uh, thank you for, for sharing. This was really important today. Thank you everyone. Thank you parents for joining the conversation. Absolutely. Irene is a rock star. So I'm so glad she joined us. And thank you everyone for sharing with each other. That was fantastic. This is LD Expert Live. I'm Jill Stowell here with Irene Lee, Director of Stowell Learning Center in Pasadena. Today we talked about how to talk to your kids to improve self-esteem, performance, and executive function. I think there were a ton of takeaways. I'm going to run off some for you really quickly. One, the words of parents and teachers have a strong impact on kids. Two, students will do well when they can. When students struggle with learning or school, they're not doing it on purpose. Three, the frustrating or alarming behaviors that we often see are a student's way of coping with their learning challenge. Four, approach challenges and praise with a growth mindset. Five, be honest and give constructive feedback and give kids the tools they need to be successful. And six, you have to keep at it. Changing any habit or learning anything new takes frequency and consistency. Thank you again, Irene, for sharing your insights and passion for helping kids and parents be successful. Irene is the director of Stowell Learning Center in Pasadena, California. If you would like to connect with her about your child, wherever you are in the country, call 626-808-4441 or visit stowellcenter.com. This is LD Expert Live your place for answers and solutions for learning disabilities, dyslexia, and attention challenges. We're live every Tuesday at 10 a.m. Pacific. Earlier, we mentioned kids who have real struggles with behavior. Just like learning, there are reasons behind what they do, but the conventional methods of changing their behavior don't always work. So next Tuesday, we have Deborah Anafarian, a parent in the trenches and a certified collaborative problem solving consultant with us to help you understand your behaviorally challenged child or student and how to help them. Be sure to join us next Tuesday at 10. Stowell Learning Centers are open for remote sessions and screenings so you can access our services wherever you are in the world. We are also seeing students on site with all of the COVID precautions. We work with children and adults doing targeted brain training to improve thinking and learning. Our goal is that students are going to be able to permanently resolve their learning or attention challenges. And we do that by identifying and developing the underlying processing or learning skills that are at the root of the child's dyslexia, attention, or struggles socially or in school, and remediating the reading, writing, spelling, or math. If you would like a free consultation for yourself, for your child, give us a call or visit our website at stowellcenter.com. Thank you again, Irene. Such valuable information. And thank you, all of you who have been sharing and commenting and subscribing and joining us each week. We love connecting with you. We'll see you next week.